Thanks, Phil. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here I, for a couple of reasons. One is that I recognize maybe 80% of you in the room, including my neighbors. Um, and secondly, I, I want to tell you a deep, dark secret. Uh, every time I ran for office, I was accused of being a liberal. Um, and so I would say, no, I'm not a liberal, I'm a progressive. And people would say either, what's that, or isn't that in California? Um, so it, it's really nice to know that there are progressives who call themselves progressives in Arizona, and I was not the only one of them. Um, there's much to agree with, with what Ted has said, including probably the big punchline, which is that we're in deep doo-doo as a democracy. And everybody is looking for a silver bullet to try to fix it before it's too late. Um, there probably comes a point in the history of any political system when it does become too late. We're not there yet. It's still fixable. But I also want to caution you that there ain't no silver bullet. And anyone who tells you that there is one I think it has to show you that the costs of using that silver bullet are not greater than the benefits of using it. Now I want to suggest to you a couple of issues with this initiative. Because on the surface of it, it looks really cool. And on the surface of it, it's very hard to object to. But first of all, it is not an issue about open primaries. This proposition is about nonpartisan elections. And there's a huge difference between open primaries and nonpartisan elections. Secondly, it is not about clean and fair elections or campaign finance reform. It will do the very opposite of what clean and fair elections do in campaign finance reform. Much of what Ted has said makes a lot of sense, but it's based on two fundamentally flawed problems. One is that voting is a rational act. And I'm sorry it is. We all know it's not a rational act. Now I want to apologize immediately and say that all of you are rational. It's the rest of us out there who are not. We don't vote rationally. We vote emotionally. You can't vote rationally. I would defy you to find a significant major election where you know that you're going to cast your vote and you will make the difference. You know you won't, but you're going to go vote anyway. Why do you do that? I would crawl on my hands and knees to vote in the middle of a blizzard that we don't have, um, to cast a ballot, because to me it's a deeply emotional act. It's a deeply emotional act about my country, it's a deeply emotional act about some set of policies. It is maybe a deeply emotional act about my party. But it is not a rational act. And if you give me a rational approach, I will tell you what the consequences are going to be. In a minute. Secondly, it's based on another idea. That somehow if we take away the labels of Republican and Democrat, we will be available to more information about candidates. And we will be able to make better judgments about who they are. As a Democrat, not a happy Democrat, but as a Democrat, I want to tell you that I think that's bunk. That all those people who believe themselves to be Democrats, and all those people who believe themselves to be Republicans, still believe that that label makes a difference. It gives them some information about who they are and who the party is. may not be very good information. may not be a lot of information. But if you watched, for example, the reauthorization of women, the Violence Against Women Act in the Senate of the United States yesterday and today, you will know that there were 32 votes cast against that act. Every single one of them were Republicans. Every single one of them were Republicans. There was not a single Democrat that voted no against that reauthorization. 
Could you have guessed that before coming into this room? I would have guessed that before coming into this room. I know that information. So when I go and vote, I probably have a little bit more information right now than I would if there was no party label attached to either of the two or three or five candidates running for office. The reason why we have clean and fair elections, the reason why there is a line out there that says abolish corporate personhood, is because there is an enormous amount of money being spent in American politics today. All that money is designed to give you as little information as possible, as much distorted information as possible about the candidates who are running for office. And what the Supreme Court has done is to create a kind of environment today where one corporation, Exxon Oil, for example, could use one quarter of its annual profits and buy every single Republican and Democratic presidential candidate's campaign and that of every person running for the Congress of the United States, one company, one company, on one quarter of one year's profits, worthwhile investment for Exxon. Imagine what two or three companies could do. And when they buy that, what you will find is a flood of information that will overcome all the other information available to you. When I ran for office, every time I ran, I was outspent two to one, three to one, five to one, six to one. I was able to win because I had a lot of support out there that was grassroots, but I also had a party labeled next to mine that was able to overcome a great deal of that money advantage. When we go to nonpartisan elections, that's gone. It is gone the same way that clean and fair elections will be gone and corporations will be voting very, very aggressively in all of these so-called nonpartisan elections. But I gotta tell you what the other part of the story is. It's the emotional part. When we go to nonpartisan elections, turnout will dramatically go down. <coughs> dramatically go down. Let me give you a contrast. I don't want to talk about Washington. I want to talk about Arizona, because this is not going to get passed in Washington. This is going to pass or fail in Arizona. And I know the state of Washington. I have a lot of good friends there who are in office. And there's a culture in Washington, in the state of Washington, not Washington, D.C., in the state of Washington, a political culture that I would love to bring to the state of Arizona. It doesn't exist in this state. It's a very, very different place. But let me tell you what happens in here. The city of Phoenix has nonpartisan elections for mayor. They just had the highest turnout in their history in their mayoral race last year. The turnout was 25%. The city of Tucson has partisan elections. The legislature has tried to ban those partisan elections, and it's only because of the courts that we still have partisan elections. The legislature, I'm assuming, tried to ban partisan elections in Tucson to give an advantage to Republicans running in Tucson. The city of Tucson had mayoral elections the same year that the city of Phoenix had mayoral elections. Partisan elections. They were not heavily contested. In fact, if you'll recall, they couldn't find a Republican to run for office. They had to find a guy at the last minute who stood up and said, okay, I will run. And Rich Grinnell ran against Jonathan. And we had a mediocre turnout of 43%. 43% compared to the record turnout of 25% in Phoenix. Nonpartisan elections on one side, partisan elections on the other side. Compare our culture with the culture of Texas cities, for example, that stripped themselves of partisan elections and went to nonpartisan elections. The average turnout in most Texas cities for mayor's race is 9%. Sometimes they get to 11%. Those are heavily contested races. 11%. Who votes in those races? You know, you will vote, and I will vote, and then there may be one other interest group that will vote. 
And maybe city employees will vote. I like that. I like city employees. Maybe they will vote. And then nobody else is going to vote. Because the rest of the folks are trying to figure out who are these people who are running. And I can't even tell whether or not they're even Democrats or Republicans. Sometimes they flash it around quietly. Sometimes they don't. Republicans hide it when they're in the minority. Democrats hide it when they're in the minority. But we get less information rather than more information. So most of us who are emotionally committed to either public policies and want to know what these people are going to do in office, or that where some of us are committed to parties and we think that the Democrats will do a better job than the Republicans, he can have hoped. And that's a huge, huge problem. Happens less in the state of Washington because in the state of Washington, there's an entirely different political culture. And are the parties good? I wish I could tell you that my party was great. I have a lot of reservations about the Democratic Party. In fact, I think that the single biggest thing going for us is the Republican Party. <laughs> and I think if President Obama gets reelected, there may not be a Republican Party in another four years. It will disintegrate between the moderate core that doesn't speak and the right wing that tries to control the party. And maybe we'll get back to an entirely different party system where the Democrats are going to have to reform themselves and the Republicans are going to have to reform themselves. Maybe if we're really lucky. Until then, we are going to have corporate personhood we are going to have $2 billion spent on the presidential elections this year. They ain't going to come from you and me. 98 cents of every dollar that goes for paying for campaigns comes from the top one quarter of 1% of Americans, both on the Democratic and on the Republican side. Don't you believe for a second that it comes from $15, $20 contributions on the internet? Because add those up, and they do not add up to even anywhere near to a half a million dollars, half a billion dollars. That's the single biggest problem we have right now. And it has tilted and altered the nature of campaigning to the point where in the Congress of the United States, with the gigantic upset on the Republican side capturing the Republicans capturing the House of Representatives on the Republican side two years ago, 92% of all incumbents who ran for re-election got re-elected. 92%. And that was a sweeping landslide for the other party. You know what that re-election rate is? The re-election rate in the presidium of the Soviet Union during Soviet times rigged one-party elections the re-election rate to the presidium was 92%. The same as in our democratic elections. That's the power of money. That's the power of incumbency. It's not about the disenfranchisement of independence. It's about something else. I, I gotta say one other thing about Russell Pierce and then I will stop. Russell Pierce is an idiot. <laughs> Russell Pierce is also an ideologue. Russell Pierce is also a bad guy. And they had a recall. And you know who beat him? A guy with exactly the same public policy positions, but a gentler, nicer version. It wasn't a progressive. It wasn't a Democrat. It wasn't even a person with a different religious persuasion. The person was carefully picked, carefully chosen, had a great name, and he beat Russell Pierce. And in part it was because the establishment said we can't afford Russell Pierce anymore. But if you think we won a race against Russell Pierce, take a look at who won that seat. Progressives didn't, Democrats didn't. Public policy in the state of Arizona did not change. And that's the problem about nonpartisan elections. We do not know who we're going to get until after we got them. And I'd like to know before we get them who we're going to get. If you want to have open primaries, if you want to have uh, independence vote in Democratic primaries, I'll buy that too. But 
if you want to have independents vote in the Republican primaries, I'll buy that too. I'll even buy an entirely different version of this as long as we continue to get some decent clues, number one, about who we're electing, and number two, if we can do something about the power of this money. Because I promise you that in nonpartisan elections, special interests who pour in the millions of dollars will pour in tens of millions of dollars for their favorite candidates, and those are the two you're going to see winning the runoffs every single time in the state of Arizona. So that's my perspective, and I could be completely wrong, but that's my perspective. Thank you.